basic math uh, is first contend with your own attachment to your identity and or, or an exploration of your identity potentially being the root of suffering. And then after that, we can start dealing with saving our sentient beings. Duncan Trussell, everybody. Hi. Hi, everybody. So, Duncan, what do you do with guilt when it's all your fault? I don't feel guilt. I, uh, I'm, I'm a sociopathic narcissist. My therapist told me I'm the best narcissist that they've ever had in therapy. <laughs> oh, God. I can only imagine. Um, so, everyone, uh, thanks for coming. I know beautiful hot sunny day the first one we've had it uh coming into the pavilion and uh, there's duncan with his newest baby which uh next year maybe we'll see the babies maybe or just us we'll see this is selma maybe <laughs> baby so we were going to talk a little bit about what we are uh we themed this particular retreat in the midst of what is going on on Maui and also wanted to, it fits in with what you and I did, which is the audio book, the movie of me to the movie of we, yes. which we just put out a couple of weeks ago, which includes Jack and Trudy and Ramdas and Krishna Das. This is basically Krishna Das's show. He's the one who, created the movie of me he's and i think he'll come along later so we can honor him for that and i so the what we've been talking about in various ways with various tangents is renewal love and grace amidst birth and death so we've been dissecting it from different points of view uh, there's plenty of it on this island and there's uh, in terms of renewal is what people are really hopeful for. And of course, what's going on in the world is pretty uh, difficult uh, to say the very least. But I think you had some something that you would a story that you might relate that expresses some of this. Is that true? You mean about our what story? You said, I can't wait to tell you the story. <laughs> you know, I will tell you something that stuck with me in all of your stories of Neem Kroli Baba, which is he would jow you if he found out that there was some issue that you had with your family. Like, that, And I, I always thought that was so beautiful, you know, that he, he was prioritizing sort of relative reality, earth realm, karmic, connections over the grand spiritual meet the guru pilgrimage to India. I always thought that was so beautiful. And so, you know, ended up here instead of in Maui in, you know, Georgia on the coast, rain, just rain every day. Oh yeah. I've got a I've got two toddlers, a new baby, and it and the beach is there, but it's just been it's the cold it's it's the cold beach. It's just raining, but uh, you know, not to get into too per, into too, too much personal details, just because the person I'm talking about, I don't, I haven't discussed like it with them. But an estranged family member, uh, for the first time in five years, we reconnected, and uh, it's just so beautiful. It was just, it's worth it all. You know, I mean, I've been to the, since I've been on this family vacation, I've been to the emergency room oh with a top. Oh my God. <laughs> Everyone's fine by the way, but it's been a very, uh, uh, challenging sort of trip. But, uh, yeah. So talking about renewal, you know, it's something I honestly never thought would, I, I'd sort of given up on that relationship and mourned it and I thought that um that, that was it was just not gonna happen. Uh and it's such a wonderful thing. Just out of the blue, suddenly it's back again. And um, you know, so I to me that's a in my own life, that's a very powerful and uh 
beautiful thing. Um, and I think, you know, it's, I, 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 I veer towards cinema. You know, that's sort of my, uh, Jack, what's the name? Samskara. Samskara. No, Samskara, the wheel of suffering. Samskara, the habitual ways of sort of perceiving the universe. Like I habitually perceive things in a cynical way. Oh, Samskara. Samskara. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so to to have that disrupted uh, by a sudden, you know, reconnection or rebirth. Mm. It's so great, you know, it's so good to like have my cynicism completely shattered by a kind of unexpected uh, uh, moment like that to realize, oh yeah, that's just the way I was seeing things. That's not real. That's just the way my mind is picking out various phenomena and assembling them uh, in, a, in a quite negative way. So yeah, it, it's been a great trip other than the emergency room visit and uh, the fire and the two toddlers and the fires and the new baby. Hey, <laughs> you know, when you talk about Maharaji jowing people and sending them out to go back to their families, right? Go, you know, yeah. something's happening in your family. You remember that both Buddha and Jesus had a hard time when they went home, right? So, yes. even for Duncan, you know, it could happen. Even for me, that's right. A prophet is it's the last. It's the last, the final frontier of 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 Dharma practice. It's back to the family. It, yeah. it is, and you know, I think that that is really where my mind has been. You know, I when you're like when I was in college or, or in high school, I think I saw The Razor's Edge with Bill Murray, and I don't know if you've seen that or how long it's been since you've seen it, but Bill Murray, Bill Murray. is. Is it's a serious role, and he's it's based on a book I think by Somerset Maham. I'm not sure, but essentially it's the he takes a spiritual journey to the east and comes back to the west, and you know his version of enlightenment is very to me very funny because it's like the shrug emoji on your phone. It, it's because he's kind of like just judging everybody and he's very he's like detached in this emotionless way that's my interpretation uh, but that that sort of myth of like go to the cave go to the guru you must leave where you're at to sort of travel to this place or that to gain some realization you know here on this two week vacation with my family this has been the most intense spiritual retreat of my life. And <laughs> I, 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 I love the, the Ram Das, you know, how he kept pushing the, this idea of, no, this where you're at right now, this is it. You know, th stop thinking that if you go here or there or wherever, you're going to find something. And I think that goes back to Maharaji's jow compassionate jowing, which is to point out like, no, you are already there. You came to the wrong place. You were already in your retreat. You were retreated from your retreat by coming to India. Uh, let me just say, Maharaji kicked us out, Jao, because he was just bored with these kids, you know, these hippies that were always around, you know, grabbing, grabbing. So, oh, go, go, that Vipassana retreat? Go. Very good. Off we went. But it was nothing to do with uh, that plane of reality. There was a much bigger one which includes meeting Jack, and Joseph, and Sharon, and how close yeah. Ram Dass and, and we were with them, and look where we are now. I mean, it's pretty graceful. So, um, I, want to, I want to ask, but you mentioned one thing, which is a, something I work with a lot, cynicism. So there's a way in which, uh, no, you know, it's, it's like warped Viveka, okay? To some degree, I, I always appreciate the, the, the spiritual discrimination, right, Jack? Mm -hmm. and then, I believe it's called discernment. discernment. <laughs> you can discriminate, that's fine, feel free. But for 
Anyway, go ahead. Keep going. No, no. <laughs> no, so I'm For just the more saying, discerning of us. Yes, keep going. Yeah, the, the <laughs> cynic thing. I mean, Duncan and I talk about it a lot. You know, uh, we have an affection for uh, Larry David. And that's a difficult... Ram Dass, I tried to get him to watch Curb Your Enthusiasm. And he watched a little bit and he said, I'm not watching this. This is awful. He's awful. You know, but uh, and of course, Duncan actually acted. That's the first. That's the first thing I've heard about Ram Dass that I didn't like. That's <laughs> one of the best shows. And you were on it too. Come on, I had a. I was an extra in that. The embarrassing. <laughs> We're all no, extras. So, That's how it works. Yeah, you know that. Yeah. You think you're on stage in the center of the spotlight, and you're actually just a little extra in on scene. And we earlier today, someone came up to me. Maybe it was Trudy or who mentioned mentioned our dear friend Wes Scoop Nisker, who died this year. Yeah. Who was this really great, witty, um, Dharma radio? He was kind of like John Stewart. A generation before on the radio, he told the truth and he did it with humor. And his byline was, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. And he would be on the, his radio station in Berkeley back in the day. And he said, today I'm going to host Tim Leary. I picked him up in North Beach at one of those, you know, cafes there. We're driving over the Golden Gate Bridge. He's reporting. And he says, there he says, why don't we drop some acid going over the bridge? Sure, okay, we get back to the studio. Here we're tripping, here's our... And um, when I got to San Francisco, the San Francisco Chronicle listed the 10 most influential people in the Bay Area, and he was one of them. Everybody loved to listen because he would tell the truth about what was going on, the wars. And he said, aren't you all sick of it? What do we... You know, and, um, but he was very cynical. He was cynical and he would be, he would get depressed. And then he would come to me and he'd say, what do I do? I feel so depressed. I feel cynical. Really? I didn't know that. Either. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. But and he, that's what happens. What? Well, that's what happens. I mean, because, you know, I think when I'm getting cynical, when I'm getting depressed, it's when I'm only seeing one side of the story it's relative reality you know when i'm getting locked into just the phenomena what he did is he turned it into humor Mm -hmm. you know and it was a beautiful thing because it had that truth it's like annie lamott who was up here the thing i love about annie one of many things is that she doesn't have a filter and she kind of says whatever comes through and you go yeah i actually thought that too but i would never say that out loud (laughs) and she does and there's something about having that twinkle. It's like Ramdas, you know, who would say, "Oh, that's just my personality. Don't worry about it." Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Well, what about fashionable? You know, to me, there seems to be a kind of fashionable cynicism these days. It's not, you know, there's the cynicism that you run into people like Annie Lamont that's beautiful, mystical, and then there's this kind of lazy, fashionable cynicism it's sort of like an identification like i think everything is rotten you say that as a sort of salute to people to to to, to distinguish yourself it's almost like a kind of pseudo sophistication i'm so tuned in to the world that i am certain that this is the most horrible of times and to me as someone who has fallen prey to that i i think that that's a very one-sided view of things. Like, no doubt, if you look out into the world or watch the news or go on the, go on the websites that I visit, you do see a hellscape. And yet, simultaneously, there's this kind of imminent beauty. Maybe it hasn't emerged yet. Like, I, I was reading this book by Thomas Merton, and he said people would say to him, How can you say there's a God when you look out in the world and there's so much horror and suffering? What kind of God would do that? And his response was, the fact that we are still here knowing what brutality and violence humans are capable of, to me, is proof that there's a God. Because 
we would have destroyed ourselves long ago. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the angle that is easy to lose sight of in the, when you are getting magnetized towards the horrors of the world. And, and I, and, and, and especially when on top of that, you're trying to distinguish yourself as a knower of truth by agreeing with those around you that we are living in hell. I want to investigate a little bit of what he and I have been talking about a lot, quoting you rather a lot, which is around, it's okay to be human and how I, I even have found people or even myself, hopefully not too much going into a little bit of a bypass around responsibility. One time, uh, Ramdas, we were with Trumpa Rinpoche in in uh, Vermont, man, the tail of the tiger, and he called Ramdas up. There's a video. I think you may know this story, and it was he was giving a talk about Don Juan, the way of the Yaki, the Brujo, and uh, he said to Ramdas, Ramdas. You've got to be responsible. And Ramdas said something like, the universe, I am part of the universe and I will fulfill my, you know, something a little more intellectual. And Trump brought him up and, and really went at what that meant in terms of individual responsibility. Related in this case to, I totally believe that when you, when I repeated what you say, it, creates an ease with people it created with me when i first heard ramdas that he was so honest with himself about his foibles and so on that it made me feel okay it's okay i can be okay but how does that run into potentially uh, a little bit left around taking responsibility well you're you're talking about different dimensions the personal one and maybe our collective the personal one, Suzuki Roshi, summed up quite simply when he looked out at people in the Zendo and said, you're perfect just the way you are. You know, because everyone's trying to be a good Zen student, right? That's what you do in a Zen center. You try to be good. At least the, the actual thing is you try to look good, right? You may not feel it, but you're a good looking Zen student. Uh -huh. um, he said, you're perfect just the way you are. And there's still room for improvement. So it sort of has both those sides of our reality in some fashion. Um, and that means somehow about loving who you are and your humanity. And I've talked to Ram Dass and said, you know, I got caught in this and I, I thought I'd solve this. And, I, and he just laughed. He said, oh, yeah, I flunked that course a couple times, too. I was like, oh, if Ram Dass flunked it, I'm in good company, mm -hmm. right? feel better. So there's the part about loving yourself and then sensing that, of course, you can manifest in more beautiful and wonderful ways, can, or caring ways, or less, maybe on the other side, a little bit less resentful or mean or selfish or something like that. But then, if I am understanding you, Raghu, Trumpo was talking to, also talking to Ramdas about responsibility in the world, in your family, in your community, yeah. to the world that's falling apart. Um, and that's the bodhisattva. That's the bodhisattva is, and I'm going to talk about it tomorrow afternoon. The bodhisattva in Buddhist tradition, bodhi means enlightenment and sattva is a being who's committed to the awakening of all or to the alleviation of suffering for all being. And when you take the bodhisattva vow, then that's what you do with your life, you know, yeah, it's tough, right? Um, but it's to reach out your hand and mend the places that you can touch. That we're each in a certain mysterious place in this universe, born into this culture, this family, this moment, and so forth. And you have the capacity to make something beautiful of it, make something better, to alleviate suffering, to bring something of benefit. That's the game. Well, why should I do that? Well, 
because it brings happiness. I mean, there's nothing in some way that brings more satisfaction than uplifting us all together. We all know that in some deep way and letting it come through what's unique in you. So I think Trumpa was just saying to Ramdas what the Buddhists would say too. All right, yes, you take a breath, you take the half step back that Trudy talked about, you quiet the mind, you heart, open the heart, and then you get up and somebody's hungry and you feed them. Somebody fell down and you help them up. Um, it's not all that complicated. And yeah, there's the spiritual bypass. It's all a dream. It is all a dream. But part of the dream is to serve each other. Did I answer your question or did I just go off in some weird Buddhist tantra? No, it all comes down to bodhisattva and bodhijita, doesn't it? Duncan. Good luck. Duncan. Bodhisattva Duncan. You are... Uh, one more little thing. So we're with the Bodhisattva, we're with the Dalai Lama, a whole group of us as teachers hanging out and talking with him about the role of teacher and how we get tired. You know, it's it's like any other job. Okay, you got to go to work. Let's see what time it is. I got to go sit up here and punch the clock, right? And um, we talked about the need for being off duty. Is Western lamas and Western you know, the swamis and lamas and mamas and stuff who were the Westerners who'd come to sit. Mostly there were a few other Tibetan lamas and other teachers. And what did he think about the need to take time off and take care of yourself and get a little, you know, ah, step back from all that. And he looked up and he said, hmm, bodhisattva off duty? <laughs> and this quizzical song. Bodhisattva yeah. off duty you know however he yeah. said it I don't want to do his accent but it was like there was this amazing moment like okay here we are punch the clock and get time off it's a very western notion yeah. of how we should live right and then the Dalai Lama saying no you know when you take the Bodhisattva vows that's it that's what you do you wake up and you're the Bodhisattva and you move through the world and you bring blessing which is why you should never take those vows. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Duncan. For some of us, it's too late. I don't know how you undo it. Too late. And also, I think, like, uh, you know, I was so, I'm my teacher, David, I was listening to this audio book he recommended um, about emptiness, and I was so relieved to find out that, you know, these are there's stages here you're sort of talking about like trigonometry, uh, which is the Bodhisattva vow and becoming a Bodhisattva. But thank God for remedial students like me, there are, there's like just basic math. And the basic math uh, is first contained with your own attachment to your identity and or, or an exploration of your identity is potentially being the root of suffering. And then after that, we can start dealing with saving all sentient beings. But first, there's a, there's a progression here. Because intellectually, I can grasp the Bodhisattva stuff. And I tried in the beginning to do that. I'm going to save all beings. Meanwhile, I'm a wreck. I'm angry. I'm irritable. I'm vengeful. I'm diabetic. I'm just a mess. But I'm going to save all beings first. No way. It doesn't work like that. You have to, that's like building the house from the top down. So I think there's something to be said for not every, people who come to the retreats, they're mystics there who are enlightened. And I'm certainly not that. So it is a joy to find out, well, you know, first you could just start with, the, you could be a bodhisattva to yourself first. Are you suffering? If the answer is yes, why? And then begin an exploration of that. And then maybe, maybe, at some point, you you could save everybody else, but it's like a fire, it's like a fireman uh, setting themselves on fire and then running into a house to save people. How are you going to be an effective fireman, fire person? How are you going to do that? So I think first, you know, discover how to mitigate your own suffering. Why are you suffering? Are you suffering? You know, that's a big, that's a very important question. And if you are, why? And you know, this is why I love Buddhism. I think it's a map. That, that I have not been able to 
use my cynicism to destruct yet. And uh, so, you know, I like the steps. I like the slow steps. I love reincarnation, that that topography, you know, because I'm going to need so many more lives before I get to Bodhisattva. <laughs> well, Ramdas also would say, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but uh, I remember many times Ramdas talking about we, uh, we engage with, uh, and I'll speak broadly, not exactly what he said, fixing our own hearts so that we can go out and radiate that to other people. But yeah. he would say, you don't wait until you think you're cooked and you're, you're able, you know, then you can really serve. You do both actions at the same time. You know what? If I'm stuck in a burning house, I will take a flaming fireman if it means there's a chance I get out. <laughs> so, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, talking about fire, actually. Um, so, you know, in the book, we we talk about, you brought up this in very uh, interesting analogy, which I'd love for you to share, around pyromania. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't remember what it was. Come on. Remind How we me. light eat, uh, ourselves on fire through our emotions and thoughts, etc. Oh, uh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You, yeah. You, yeah, we self-crucify. Like, it's so, you can't physically crucify yourself, but, you know, have you ever thought about that? Like, if you tried to crucify yourself, it'd be impossible. Because you, one hand has to like hammer the other hand, but once this hand gets here, what are you going to do with this hand? I guess you could thrust it back on the nail, but weirdly, like emotionally, we can self-crucify, you know, and 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 witness our own crucifixion. I think that's what I was talking about. But in in in, in the what you're talking about was, uh, I, I guess the ex horrible example I was using was setting yourself ablaze over and over and over again. Um, I don't know why. What am I? Am I a pyromaniac? Why am I using fireman examples? <laughs> Setting yourself on fire examples. Jack, you're a therapist. I am i don't know. It's, help I, him it's out. A two, he needs help. Two-week vacation. I'm at the end of a two-week vacation in a condo with two toddlers and a baby. So if I seem a little off right now, <laughs> it, I'm barely holding it together. Okay, poor guy. Um, but what we were trying to do, oh, and the man is here, actually, who invented this whole thing. And uh, why don't you come up anyhow? So, uh, I mean, the youngest. Middle. So, middle now. <laughs> there he is. Can you see him? I How's your Chalisa? How's your Chalisa coming? Yeah, you. Look at my AI, Chalisa. I don't have to do hey, it now. Somebody uh, <laughs> took took one of my Hanuman Chalisa melodies and oh, substituted God. Duncan's voice with AI. It was extraordinary. Let me tell you. Blasphemy! Extreme. Blast. I've never, honestly, I don't get offended much, but that was one of the worst things I've ever seen. And I've seen uh, horrible things. I like second that. that. Yeah, it was close. <laughs> so uh, I asked Christian us to come hang out before the Chalisas. Uh, this whole premise, which around what Duncan and I did off and on for five years and finally got it together is the movie of me. And we only knew about it because Krishnas would talk about it in various uh, kirtans and uh, workshops. Anyhow, can you give us the movie of me? So it Demonstrate. Was... Replay? Yeah, <laughs> replay. So we wake up in the morning, start writing, producing, directing, being in movie of me. All day long. Oh, how am I? Where am I? They like me. They don't like me. What should I wear? Am I too tall? Am I too short? Too fat? Too skinny? What should I do? Where should I go? All lifelong. Just and then we write reviews, which we read and get even more depressed. But you can't stop those thoughts. 
but it goes on and on by itself. That's the whole, the whole trick is learning how to let go. Again and again, again and again. And every time we let go, the movie just goes on by itself. We're no longer involved with it in the same way. Uh, and that's really a big thing. Because most, most people, you know, like I said the other day, we get born, graduate high school, drink some beer, and we die. And that's it. We're not here for a second in a whole life. So the fact that we can begin to become aware of this me, 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 me flow that goes on pretty much by itself is a really big thing. And we took it one step further and said the movie of me to the movie of we. So we started talking about how that transformation happened. And one interesting thing, which uh, we at one point, because it was over five years, so at one point, oh, it's the pandemic. We have to kind of reference what's going on there. And we talked about contagion. And uh, I lo actually, this came from you, Duncan. Uh, love is the contagion we need right now. And boy, does that uh, ring true in terms of what's going on in this world. But I guess... Uh, it's very contagious. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, this... Uh, this pandemic that happened, you know, what I, I think like the discipline right now is like you have to find a way to everything has its opposite. And the one thing the pandemic showed us is how incredibly connected we all are right now. Incredibly connected. You know, the Black Plague, this is Genghis Khan's fault, I think, like because like. Uh, trade routes were developed. It, it produced like the bubonic, it, the possibility of the plague spreading around the planet. And because of that, I don't remember the percentage of humans that died, but an insane amount of people died. And this uh, COVID thing that happened is an ex another example of like how, our, how being so connected produces this incredible possibility for like massive die offs. And so, yes. Most people stop there and then crawl into their bunker, pull up their blanket, throw on their masks and shiver in horror. But I think that sort of thing also demonstrates the other possibility, which you're talking about, and which drives me crazy. Any acid head worth their weight in salt has the epiphany that, my God, we are always on the precipice of world peace. It's right there, a second away, like this contagion that happens with fear which leads to violence which leads to war all of it it's all if that is possible then the other thing must also be possible i mean this drives people like us nuts because you know that we're one step away from the opposite kind of contagion happening we're so connected now i mean think how long it took for the dharma to spread around the planet think how long that took for those teachings to make their way to the West, which really just happened relative to how long it's been around the planet. And, 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 and imagine like how quickly something like that could instantaneously spread around the planet. Like that, that sort of contagion, contagion is probably the wrong word for it. It's a, it's a pretty negative word, but yeah, I think that, you know, the Bodhisattva idea that Jack is talking about, it's great. It's great. I love it. Uh, I will not take those vows in this lifetime. I wouldn't take those vows for a million dollars. But I do think that being a small part of, of someone becoming a, the, that Bodhisattva, you know, a little like grain of sand pushing the scales in that direction, that's what we're all capable of. That's very exciting to me. I, I think that's it, it. We it's so easy to get caught, caught up in the apocalyptic overtones or undertones of the day, and forget that the very thing that is producing that also creates the possibility of what we're talking about there—an uh, an instant, almost instantaneous shift in consciousness that is unprecedented in recorded history. You know, you ever hear, uh, Jack, there's a, a Chinese 
term for times of chaos, unpredictability, and it translates in English to dangerous opportunity. You heard that? I have heard it, and I've heard Joanna Macy talk about the great turning that we're in, where collective we've come to the end of the way we can function separately on the planet, and we have a choice. There's a shift in consciousness that's invited now. This is kind of the, um, we're doing the anti-cynic hymn right now. I thank you for, yeah. for leading in the, uh, leading us in this, Duncan. And there's a, there's a famous story about um, Margaret Mead, who was, who was talking about Gregory Bateson. I think it was you, KD, was it? Somebody talking about Gregory Bateson? No, somebody in this in our room here. But anyway, um, Margaret Mead was asked at one point what she saw as the earliest signs of human civilization. And beside cultural anthropology, she was involved in the cave paintings and in the paleo paleontology and so forth. And so people kind of wondered what she would say. And she said, oh, it's much older than that. She said, at one of these digs, we found the bones of an adult person who had broken their leg. It was clear that the leg had been broken and then it was healed. She said, and you think about that, if an animal broke its leg out on the plains in Africa where they were, um, it would be left to die. You know, there's not much to do about it and eventually it would starve or, you know, Without water, it would die, and then other animals would come eat it. But she said, this human animal broke its leg, and somebody had to carry it to safety, carry that person. And somebody had to bring water and food for a long time and take care of that being until their leg could heal and they could again join in the activity of the community. And she said that... That's the beginning of human civilization. And that's really what we're talking about here, that we can reawaken to that, that we can actually carry each other in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Walking each other home. Or yeah. carrying sometimes. Hey, <laughs> come on. <laughs> With our limbs. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, and that's, it's so easy. to. That, that is the thing that you won't see on the news. For some reason, the, the news imminent is, possibility. It's all about eyeballs and time, and we, we're tuned. Our nervous system, we all know this, is tuned to emergency. 911, here, watch this terrible yeah. thing and that. Okay, I better be careful. That's how we get attention. Nobody wants to watch yeah. the fact that two billion mothers served rice gruel and scrambled eggs to their children this morning somewhere on the planet, all over, and the kids ate it, and Cheerios or whatever it was, Odeos, and they all <laughs> ate it, and everybody yeah. was smiling. And that happened for the huge majority of human beings on this planet. Didn't make the news, but it's there. That's it. You know, Jack, this is something I wanted to mention to you. I started thinking about Buddha's great, 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 great grandfather. Does anyone know who that was? Sure. Yeah, you mean Joe? <laughs> Come on. Really? Is that is it how far back does it Padma, trace? How, Oh, that's easy. He said he sat under the Bodhi tree and at one point he looked into his past lives and there were thousands of them. No, I mean literally Buddha's great 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 grandfather. Does anyone know who that was? What makes you, why, why are you asking this? What's going on here? Because they get no credit. They get no credit. Buddha, the Buddha, the great Buddha. No one talks about how his great, 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 great grandfather hadn't consummated. We hadn't hooked up with Buddha's great, great, great grandmother. There's no Buddha. No Buddha. They get no credit. No one talks about it. And this is to me a travesty. And, and, and I think that if we talk about this thing that I love, the Maitreya, uh, the second coming of Christ, there's all kinds of names for it. 
cut the thing we all know is coming. We can run and feel it. In a way, every single one of us is the great, great, great grandmother, grandfather, grandfriend of that thing that's coming. And see, to me, that's very empowering. And, and, and as a remedial student in this stuff, I think I can be some small part of that. No one talks about the bird that flew by. It may be inspired Buddha's great, great, great grandfather to write a nice poem for his great, 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 great grandmother, which helped them hook up. I'm sorry to say hook up. I'm trying to think of a more romantic. I mean, are we supposed to watch the great, great, great grandparents get it on? Is that what you're saying? I, would, <laughs> I mean, if I could, I would. I don't think that's possible. But if that was on the internet, that would be one of my first searches. My, my point is, this is... In, Something happens, and, and I, the Bodhisattva dream is beautiful, but to me, there is a possibility there of an accidental egoism. Now you're super, you're Superman, you're Spider-Man, you're going to save the whole world. But what about this idea of like, maybe you could be the, the, you could be the person that Buddha's great, 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 great grandfather walked by when he was like, I'm not asking that woman out. She would never, she, she doesn't like me and smiled at him just the right way to give him the confidence to say, hey, do you want to, should we, I'm not, should we hook up? It's hot. How long did you, how have you been thinking about this for how long? <laughs> do you really want to know? Yeah. About a month. Oh my God. God, have you not talked to your meditation instructor about restructuring that thought pattern? David, is David here? <laughs> Maybe we can get him up here. A, oh, no, no. I think it's a good thought pattern. I'm just saying, how about this idea of like diffusing the responsibility a little bit from like saving all sentient beings and maybe like leaning into the possibility that all of us could be one little, little grain of sand, one little drop in the bucket that leads to this thing that we can feel is possible. I mean, to me, that's what it's all about. That's where the rubber hits the road for me. Because when I start thinking about saving suffering beings in Alpha Centauri, I check out, man. I mean, let them suffer. Hey, well, you need to bring it back a little bit. You know, just how do, how do we deal? Just deal with uh, all of us are dealing with, you know, being involved with too much of uh, separation. Let's just start there where, yes. where the movie of me and separation uh, are little fragile egos which are protecting ourselves. Let's start yes. there. Forget about that other stuff. Yes, that that's can you, that's the synopsis. Can you talk about that actually, Krishna? A little bit about the, how that me feels so separate and alone and disconnected with the fact of, you know, I mean, as Duncan said, we did get a lesson on interconnectivity, by virtue of the uh, uh, of the grandparents of the Buddha, right? Great, 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 great. Yes, <laughs> great, great. Let's talk. I'd like to just hear something about the cure for that kind of separation. I wish I knew. Um, my own personal experience was when uh, Maharaji made us chant for days and days and days and days and days and um at the time you know we just thought of chanting as just some something you do and there's no tv you know just like you're in india what do you in do india. okay meditate or you chant and, but uh when the kirtan wallace got kicked out of kenchi he had the westerners start chanting all day for many hours, and it, it was actually brutal. Really, With brutal. how long? I mean, I was, it was seventy-two fall, so I had gone by then, right? Yeah, Seven. seventy-two fall. Yeah. yeah. How long? You actually lived that yeah, day me. after day after day, day after day, morning till till evening, and I think I was living in the temple then, so there was no time off. You know, it was just mm. all the time, and. uh it was a struggle, you know, uh, I didn't even try to pay attention. You know, I wasn't doing it as a spiritual practice. I was doing it because he said, do it. So we're doing it. But 
eventually, uh, eventually there was a, some kind of figure ground kind of reversal. And instead of me thinking, which I had been doing at that point for 22 years, solid, <laughs> all of a sudden there was thoughts and there was awareness of thoughts. And there was no body there thinking. Because when we think, when we think, we think we're thinking. You know, that's part of the thing. We think that's us Identity. doing that. Thinking, you know, yeah, I'm thinking about that. Yeah, you know. But really, it's just a thought that's coming from the past or somewhere into this moment, just like a wave coming off the ocean into the shore and it crashes and we're thinking. In fact, that reminds me of an acid trip I took once oh. <laughs> a long time ago. So I've been up for like 36 hours, totally zoned on a thousand mics of Sandoz oh. acid. Unbelievable. Oh, praise God. You're so lucky. Yeah, I had 10 hits of this. Here's another. So. At my 50th high school reunion, I met the guy who I bought the acid from 50, yeah. 50 years before, you know, or 49 years before. And I said to him, man, that acid I got from you, I, you know, I took the first hit and, you know, I was in school by the last hit. I was on my way to India. And he goes, really? I took thousands of hits and I never got off a of Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so back to that. So I'm lying in my bed, just zoned out. I've been up playing with my dog for 36 hours in the snow. And finally, I'm just like, ah, you know. And there was a window on the other side of the room, kind of in front of me. I'm just gazing out the window. And all of a sudden, I felt something coming towards me through the window from outside coming towards me. It's like, what is this? And it's coming closer and closer. And it's like, what the fuck is this? What's happening? What is, what? Oh, oh no, 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 it's a thought. <laughs> and then I was thinking. And then after some indeterminate period of time, don't leave, don't go, don't go. Ah. And there was no thinking. And then, and then they started coming faster and faster and faster and faster. And then there was, there was me. Because <laughs> me is just a bundle of thoughts. There's nothing else. Thoughts, emotions, memories, it's all thought, concepts. And when, when we're not glued to them, it's a very different feeling. Very different. So... That happened again in the chanting in, oh. in, in Kenshi. I was chanting and, you know, my mind finally gave up after days of reliving my life and thinking about every girlfriend I ever had. And, you know, why did she break up with me? And all that, you know, all that stuff on and on and on. And on. I just kind of relaxed into the flow of the mantra. And without recognizing it at the time, there was just this space and then thoughts would float through and I would see them floating through and I, I, it wouldn't be me thinking. And um, that was 72 in 1995 in Kenshi. I had a very life-changing experience and which allowed me to come back to America and sing. Um, <clears throat> and one part of the experience was I was sitting, I was standing there, I looked up in the sky and I saw this whirling little like thing up in the sky, whirling, whirling. And I laughed and I said, ah, that's Krishna Dasness. And it was thoughts. And I, I def, I, actually saw that when I think I'm Krishnadas, 
I think I'm Krishna Das. And I act like Krishna Das. But when I don't, when I, I'm not stuck in that whirling stuff, we're just here. There's just beautiful, vast presence and space and sweetness and serenity and calm and openness and love. And the funny thing that liberated me to come back and sing was I understood very deeply that even when I'm stupid and I think I'm Krishna Das, I'm not. And that was really big time, really big time. So if you have any acid, I'd like to get back there. Are you kidding? I don't. I want to meet your acid dealer. <laughs> is he still on Long Island? Uh, that, you know what my that guy is still on Long Island to this day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm headed there. My, you know, my my kid on the beach yesterday said to me, "Dad," because he has a peanut allergy. He goes, "Dad." I think I'm allergic to my thoughts. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Are you serious? Yes, <laughs> Forrest? <laughs> yes, Forrest said that. Oh, and, and I said, me too, kid. You know, it's... Well, it's how old is he? Uh, he uh, Forrest, uh, he's almost five. Five. Oh, boy. That's Just let me say one more thing. So that experience I had is not unique to me. When we're chanting... You're, you're, you're singing, you're making noise, you're breathing, you're hearing the sounds internally, externally, there's other people singing. And then you notice that you haven't been paying attention, you've been lost in thought or daydreaming or whatever, right? You notice that. You just woke up for a second. So at that moment, you're not thinking and you're not stuck in your thoughts. You, you just woke up. So what we do at that moment is we come back to the sound of the name of the chant. Because every time you come back, we're pl you're planting a seed of coming back. And so when you're lost in the daydream and you wake up and you, re you realize that you haven't been paying attention, even though you're singing in a room full of people who are singing, you must have also created the karmas for that moment to happen. Otherwise, it couldn't have happened. So the effort that we've done in the past, the practice we've done, the experiences we've had in our own past, they all come together in this moment, ultimately to wake us up again and again and again. And gradually, but inevitably, we don't spend so much time gone. And it starts to shift where we're actually not lost in thought all day long, every day, which is how most of us, including me, spend most of our time. So that moment, but until you add a practice to your life, there's nothing to come back to. You're just washed away constantly by thoughts, emotions, reactions, and stuff. But once you add a practice to your life and you put some energy into it, even if it's just a little bit, a few minutes a day, that pulls you back again and again and again and gets deeper and deeper as time goes on. And that's what all these different practices, if you go on a retreat in the first days, as this woman came to see me after a few days, she said, help. I said, what? She said, I'm locked in a phone booth with a lunatic, <laughs> you know, which was her retreat experience. But after some days, it's like, okay, you've seen the lunatic. The lunatic has told you all the usual stories. But somehow you break out of the asylum a little bit and you go, oh, that's just the lunatic up there spinning or something. In meditation, in movement disciplines, in all the kinds of practices, it's not that they're trying to get you to some state. They're trying to make space so you can shift your identity from being who you thought you were, who you think you are, to that infinite loving awareness that actually is always here. Confession, all these practices help with that. And, you know, there's such a beauty in what we did over these many years with Ramdas here in Maui at this facility and others. The combination of what we got 
from Maharaji in India and how we bumped into you all and of course Ramdas was and us were close with you, three of you, and how that blended into these retreats is uh, quite fabulous. So so Duncan, I want to tell you a little story because I'm still thinking about the Boots Graker Crooked Pan parents getting it on or whatever. Um <laughs> But one of the one of the myths um, that goes way back is that there was the Buddha in his palace, and his parents tried to protect him from the world. And finally, he went out and he saw these four sights. The first time he had ever seen a a sick person, and then an old person, and he was kind of shocked. And then he saw a corpse, and he said to his charioteer, "Who does that happen to?" And the charioteer said, "Well, honestly, it's everybody, you know." So he was shocked. If, the, if you remember the first time you saw a dead body, by the way, it just does something. And then the fourth sight was he saw some yogi or some mendicant. He said, who's that? He said, that's somebody who's seeking to free themselves from the illusion of separation. So my good friend Ajahn Sumedho, who has um, moved to England um, and became the abbot of a temple there, and is a wonderful monk now in his 80s, um, he invited our teacher, Ajahn Chah, to go to England. Um, they were invited by the English Sangha Trust, and they were given a little apartment some parts in London. Um, and Ajahn Chah said, you practice here for a while. This would be good practice. So he was trying to, and he said, and every morning, you have to go out on alms round. And he said, why? Nobody knows about monks in alms bowl. I mean, I do it in Thailand or Burma, and everybody brings food. He said, well, how will they know if you don't go out? So he started to go out with his alms bowl. And sometimes kids would come up and like put candy in the bowl or take candy out of the bowl or whatever. It was all this stuff. And he said to Ajahn why should I do this? And he said, well, remember the four messengers. There, there's old age and sickness and death that we see that wake us up and say, okay, we better use this life. He said, but then there's the fourth one. And he said, you don't know that the next Buddha is, in, is actually not there walking the, across your path in Hyde yeah. Park and will see you and that will awaken them and they'll be the Buddha for this world. He said, so you, you need to go out there and, you know, show the flag. So Sumedha is out there with his bowl and people would come and say, what are you? Or they put something in a bowl. And someone came up to him and said, um, what are you? Or, and he said, well, I'm not I'm a monk from the forests of Thailand and Laos. I'm a forest monk. And he said, well, what are you doing in London? He said, well, we were invited and they gave us a flat. But forests, were, that's really... And he said, well, I happen to have a beautiful forest um, down south of here. And I've been wondering who might steward it. It's a few hundred acres with a big estate and manor. And um, he took out a pen and he wrote the name of the place and he put it in the bowl. He said, here... Here's your oh. forest monastery that really happened cool. Chithurst. So um, it's still happening, Duncan. You know, oh, I know. Magic is still happening all mm. the time. All the time. Look, I agree with you, Jack. I mean, you know, I'm sorry. Of I don't you mean agree to flatter with me, all. Naturally. <laughs> <laughs> How could I not? I don't mean to flatter you three, but I'm telling you, you know, uh, I just went on a I'm, I know I've mentioned this before. I just went on a two-week vacation with two toddlers. What? Trip. Erin won't let me call it a vacation. <laughs> she says trip. I just went on a two-week trip with two toddlers and a baby. And I got in maybe three relatively mild fights with my wife. Now, that might not sound like a big deal. There's still time. She just said there's still time. There's no, uh, there's no bodhisattva happening or no bowl or anything. But I'm good. this stuff, you know, as a very cynical person, you know, when I first ran into you, I knew I was prepared for you to be a complete charlatan when you did my podcast for the first time because I loved Ram Dass so much, and I thought, oh, Raghu, he's, I bet he walks up to my house wearing a ridiculous outfit, some kind of weird, I don't know bangles on or something or it's going to be an embarrassment and prove to me the whole thing is uh not true and then i met you 
do you remember? Uh, and you left. And I remember looking in the mirror and thinking, God, how rude of me to get so stoned around uh, someone who did my podcast. And then I realized, oh, I didn't, we didn't get, we didn't smoke, I'm, we didn't get high. Just hanging out with you, you know, or getting connected to, to Maharaji through you for that moment. It gave me a little taste of something. And, uh, you know, again, I'm a slow learner. I'm a remedial learner. I'm an old dad, old comedian. But um, mm-hmm. old meditator, but I'm telling you, you know, this, this, I don't mind being the great, even if it's just like a cricket that walked over the Buddha's great, great, great grandfather when he was making love to the Buddha's great, 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 great grandmother. I'll take it. And so, yeah, I feel so lucky to have the association of you three. And um, it, it, it's one of the great delights of my life has been realizing that it, the things that you have taught me are real. And that audio book we recorded, I, I, I mean, it's funny calling it a book. It's really just me having this wonderful dialogue with you yeah. uh, that I'm so lucky to have, you know, and, and so I just feel really grateful. I'm, and I'm sorry if during our many podcasts that we've done here, if I come off as crass or disrespectful or something like that, because I really... Uh, one of the luckiest things in, in my life outside of meeting Aaron has been running into you and getting to hang out with all three of you uh, over the years. Thank you. So we're going to close here with uh, one of the, uh, something from Ramdas that came actually when we did the summit, Rudy and yourself and Duncan and I and Ramdas. So at the very end of this uh session that we did with them. It was around the movie of me to the movie of we. At the very end, somebody said, Ramdas, there's a Q&A. This world is so awful, so much suffering. I, I just, I don't know how I can handle it. I don't know what to do. And so here's Ramdas's uh, prescription. Turn off your TV. <laughs> That's what he said to the person. And then he said, identify with your spirit and soul and don't involve yourself with other people's karma. We are one spirit. It's the separation that leads to fear and war. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks for having me. Coming in. Love you guys. We're going to uh, come and bring the kids next time. Today we had the wee yogis and, the, you know, they need more wee yogis. You got to bring them. Yeah, we need more. We, we, we got a couple of football Aaron, they teams want us to developing. bring the kids next year. Yeah. Um, and now, Christian. Hey, Wait, someone very important wants to oh, say hi. Hi. Love you, guys. Hey. You. Yeah, next year in Marienbad. Duncan. You can stick on because Krishnadas is about to do Chalisas because Nina is missing in action. I'm going to use your voice. (laughs) I will never. (laughs) Please don't. You guys are the best. I love you. Love you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Krishnadas will be back in a whenever. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Jack. Bye, Krishnadas. Bye, Raghu.